everybody. Welcome to Starting Line Church. We're really glad that you've joined us as we continue our Exodus series called Journeying to Freedom. And throughout this series, we've been diving into the book of Exodus and the story of the Israelites, how they were slaves in Egypt, how God rescued and freed them from that, and how they've been journeying through the wilderness ever since. We've been making our way through this series uh, since like the end of January, which is crazy. And, and I don't know about you, but I have really enjoyed it because I think it's been so relatable to our lives today. As we begin today, I have an important question for you to ponder. Are you a rule follower, a rule stretcher, or a rule breaker? I know that might not be as important as you thought of a question I was going to ask, but as you're figuring out which one you are, I've come to realize in my lifetime that chances are everyone is one of the three. Some of us think that rules were meant to be followed perfectly and exactly, and we must do what we're told because that's the rule. Some of us, others of us, think that rules can be stretched a little bit. They, they won't um, go and completely break the rule just because, but they'll break it if they think they need to. And then some of us are rule breakers, thinking that rules are meant to be broken. That's why they're there. When I was a youth pastor... Uh, we were driving home from our summer camp, which was a big uh, youth conference that we would go to every year in Indiana. And this particular we uh, year, we had 30 students uh, come to this, this particular summer, which meant we needed a lot of adult leaders and a lot of vehicles. Well, I had the privilege of driving the 12-passenger van, and I had two other vehicles behind me on our way home. We just had this great week of camp. We were on our way home, and we came to the on-ramp of the highway to go back to Michigan at the time. But there was a sign that was block, like half-blocking the, the on-ramp that said road closed. Now, I am what you call a very, very, very big rule stretcher, okay? And I thought to myself, is it really closed? Or is that sign uh, not supposed to be there? Why, why is it just like half blocking the ramp? It probably means that it's not really closed. So I came to the conclusion with my adult uh, leader passenger who probably would be classified as a rule breaker that we were gonna go for it because clearly the sign might not be right. So we go on our way and we go around the sign and on our way and there were, there were two vehicles behind me from our group. Let's just say one followed me and one didn't. One went their own way. And so as we continued onto the highway, I realized quickly that we were in some trouble. The road was completely torn up. There was no road. They were working on the highway and the only ones out there were construction trucks and us. The construction worker kind of waved at me, rolled down his window and in a lot of judgment, rightfully so. He said, what do you think you're doing? What, 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 is, what is happening here? In the midst of a lot of panic, I, I tried to explain uh, myself, but as I miserably failed at doing so, he said, follow me, I'll get you out of here. Just be careful. The good news is we got to safety, everything was fine, parents uh, did tr in fact trust me with their children again. The bad news is I've never heard the end of that story and... Zach was the vehicle who didn't follow me on the on-ramp, I'm just saying. In all seriousness, I, I bypassed the rule that was supposed to keep me safe because I fully didn't understand it. And I chose not to understand it. And in doing that, it caused me a lot of problems and I'm thankful it wasn't worse. Today we get to dive into a passage that seems to be about rules and regulations and measures to live up to. And while it seems that rules have to do with our story and they're important to our story, 
The bigger picture is that these rules to follow are actually about the importance of relationship, not about measuring up to perfection. To give us some context on what's going on, two months after the Israelites left Egypt, uh, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. And they set up their, their base at the camp at, the, the, at Mount Sinai, which, was, uh, where our, which is where our story takes place today. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was located in the wilderness of Sinai, which was in between Egypt and, in, in, and Canaan. And Mount Sinai was known to be one of uh, the kind of the most sacred places in Israel's history. So many different things happen here in different accounts in the Bible. If you remember from the beginning of our series, when Jake preached, this is the mountain that God met Moses on the burning, in the burning bush. So Moses climbs to the top of the mountain to appear before God and the Lord calls to him and he gives him instructions, a covenant that they needed to keep with God. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 20, where Moses, he gathers the people together at the bottom of the mountain and God audibly gives the Israelites these specific instructions to follow, otherwise known as the Ten Commandments. So we're going to begin reading at the beginning of Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God gave the people all these instructions. I am the Lord, your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down and worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor labor and do all work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord God is giving you. You shall not murder You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Well, there you have it. Okay, that's kind of long. There you have it. Those are the Ten Commandments that God has told the nation of Israel to keep so they would ensure their covenant relationship with God. They would solidify their connection with God. These were the things that he wanted them to live by, not because he was trying to be mean or trying to uh, ruin all their fun, but instead to protect them and to encourage them to become more like Just in case you miss them, here they are again. Do not have any gods before me. Don't make idols. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor your father and mother. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't testify falsely about someone. And do not covet. Well, I made the joke at the beginning about being a real follower, a stretcher, or a breaker. This passage about the Ten Commandments in general aren't really about stuffy rules that no one understands. They're about deep relational connection. See, the Ten Commandments are rules for relationship, not rules for perfection. Think about all these things listed here in this passage. When we do these things, we'll find out how to love God and love one another better. What God uh, is doing here with the Israelites, he's giving the Israelites here not a list of mindless rules that don't have any purpose. 
He's presenting them with an opportunity to learn about how to, to learn how to love him and love others more deeply. And that's going to point us to a really fulfilling life. So let's break these down together. The first four, they kind of come in two sections, okay? The first four commandments that God gave the Israelites were a way to deepen their relationship with God. He's asking them different things. Hey, don't put anything else before him. To not make idols out of anything that isn't him. To refrain of taking his name in vain and use, misusing it. And then to make sure that we set aside time to rest, to Sabbath, which means rest. All of these, th all of these things were very real for the Israelites. Think about it. They had just returned from Egypt a place where people didn't respect or fear their God as the one true God. So people probably misused his name because they didn't really see the seriousness of it. They just came from a place that, that didn't allow the Israelites to rest and recharge and worship their God. They had to work as slaves the entire time. It was a land that had many idols and many gods. And because each god represented a different aspect of life, so it, it was common for people to worship many gods in order to get the maximum number of blessings. But God didn't want to be one of many. He's the one true God. So all of these things, it, it's very real for the Israelites. And even though we aren't living among Moses and the Israelites, we can experience these things too. We, we can allow things in our life, in this world, to become idols and become gods to us if we don't realize we're worshiping them. Things like relationships or money or affirmation or, or our work or our pleasure or our addiction or our security. We can put so many things before prioritizing God in our lives. We can get so wrapped up in our own lives, in our own strength, in our own busyness that we forget we need to spend time resting and recharging and worshiping God. So these first four commandments are about a relationship with God. The next six, the other six, uh, that God gave the Israelites were ways for them to deepen their relationship with others. God cares about the relationships, he, the relationship he has with his people. But he also wants us to project, prioritize the relationships we have with those around us. Because he created us to be in relationship with people, to live with people. So when we look at the remainder of these commandments, they all have to do with how we treat and respect and care for other people. Where the other four impacted our personal relationship with God, each one of these not only impacts us, but it affects those around us. Honoring your parents, murder, adultery, uh, stealing, lying, jealousy, all of these different topics. In giving these commandments to the Israelites, God is calling them to step into healthy and positive relationships where none of these sins exist and to honor and respect people the way they deserve. He calls us to do the same. He calls us to run from these sins because he has so much more for us than to fall into the temptations of stealing and harming others and being jealous of what others have. He calls us to turn away from these things because they hurt and they harm others as well as ourselves. He calls us to step into a life where our relationships with others can thrive and flourish and grow. Which is why he gives these commandments to the nation of Israel. The Ten Commandments are rules for relationship, not rules for perfection. We might think to ourselves, what, what, this is great, like, that's, that's great, but what do the Ten Commandments have to do with us? How does it have to do with our lives today? If they were given to the Israelites, do they have significance for us? And my answer to all of that is yes, they are important. Because if the Ten Commandments are rules about relationship, not about rules for perfection, that means that these commandments still point us to the same thing today. To better relationship, to better understand our relationship with God and others. Where it all goes wrong 
is when we view them, all 10 of them, as a means, as a way to save ourself and to be perfect instead of allowing Jesus to save every part of us. Which brings us to our other point, the Ten Commandments point us to Jesus. They point us to Jesus. Wait, I thought we were in the Old Testament where Jesus, you know, it isn't, hasn't been born yet. Yes. Dur- but during the life of Jesus and all of his ministry on earth, there was, uh, there was a people group called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees didn't like Jesus. They were the religious leaders of the day and they loved the Ten Commandments as well as the rest of the law uh, that God gave Moses for the nation of Israel to follow. You may think this is a good thing. But they didn't love it because it encouraged them to love God and love others. They loved it because they saw it as a way of perfection. That all they needed to enter heaven is eternity. In eternity was to follow the law without error. It was a way to save themselves. And they considered themselves better and more elite than everybody else because they followed it. But then Jesus comes along and he says, hey, those things aren't there for that reason. Jesus says, hey, Pharisees, you you experience salvation and you enter heaven uh, if you say yes to me, if you follow me, if I become your savior. They missed that they were free because of Jesus. They missed that they weren't free because they were good enough to save themselves. Because in our humanity, that is impossible. They missed that they were free because of Christ. And so what we know in the Bible is that these Ten Commandments that were given to Moses were actually said similarly again in the ministry of Jesus in the New Testament. Multiple times. The message of all these Ten Commandments are repeated. So Christ's commands about loving God and loving one another aren't alternatives to the Ten Commandments. They re- it restates them in simpler terms. Therefore, Jesus didn't come. He didn't come, die for our sins, raise back to life to get rid of the laws and commandments that were given to Moses and the Israelites back in the day. He didn't come and do all that to say all those things don't matter. Jesus came to fulfill it all and say, I'm the perfect one. I'm the only one who can truly fulfill all these laws, all these commandments perfectly. Those things still matter and I still command you to do them and love one another and love God. But your salvation comes through following me. The Ten Commandments point us to Jesus. So even though we aren't the nation of Israel... As Christ followers, as the church, we're called to love God and love others. We're called to pursue holiness, which means becoming more and more like Jesus over time. We're called to go on a lifelong journey with God because coming to know him and saying yes to him is the starting line to faith and there's so much more afterward that comes. And so if we desire this life with Jesus, My prayer is that we would follow these commandments because they lead us to that kind of life.